أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم The year 35 after the holy migration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam from Mecca to Medina to the year 40 of Hijrah as amongst the most controversial years within Islamic history and indeed those five years are the years in which Al Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib had taken the chair of Khilafah from the city of Kufa. And religious and Islamic historians have examined the year 35 to the year 40 after Hijrah in many ways. However, many historians Describe those five years of the Khilafah of Imam Ali with three major or four major qualities. The first quality that they attribute to those five years of the Khilafah of Imam Ali is that the Islamic Empire and the Islamic territory was not expanded in those five years, not even by an inch. What does this mean? This means that unlike the Khulafa and the rulers prior to him, who expanded the Islamic empire and expanded the Islamic territory, and they gained a lot of wealth, a lot of gold, a lot of silver from those invaded lands, and they deposited that into the Islamic treasury. They were able to take many slaves as captives of war. They were able to gain a lot of territory and land and property and give that to the members of the Islamic army. Therefore, the years prior to him were years of prosperity, years of wealth, years of expansion, years of wars. However, while he became the Khalifa, not only the Islamic Empire did not expand by an inch, but there was no money being deposited from invaded territories in the Islamic treasury. There were no new slaves being brought into Islam to be gifted or owned by the Muslims. There were no properties and lands being gifted to the members of the Islamic army. That's number one. Number two is that he faced three major civil wars. The first war was the Battle of Jamal. 18,000 people were killed in the Battle of Jamal. The second battle was the Battle of Safin. And the Battle of Safin, 75,000 Muslims were killed from both parties. And then he, he faced the Battle of Nahawan with four to 5,000 casualties. So a total of 100,000 Muslims were killed during his khilaf. The third quality is that Bani Umayyah, the Umayyad dynasty, gained, gained strength during the years 35 to 40 after the Hijrah, while he was the Khalifa. And number four, the establishment of the Khawarij also occurred between the year 35 to the year 40 after the Hijrah. So listen carefully now. The question that arises here is whether Imam Ali was a capable Khalifa, a powerful Khalifa, a wise leader, is this a period in which historians will look back at and say, that indeed the, th the year 35 after Hijrah 
to the year 40 after Hijrah is a period where we should be proud of or is it a period of civil war, poverty, lack of expansions, and a period that indeed does not reflect the wisdom of a capable ruler. In order for us to examine this topic tonight, I have decided to break this topic into the following segments. Number one, examining the Khilafah of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib through the eyes of non-Muslims. Not the character of Imam Ali, not the wisdom of Imam Ali, not the knowledge of Imam Ali, through the perspective of non-Muslims, because they, that would by itself take many lectures. We will only examine the perspective of non-Muslim leaders and thinkers and politicians in reference to the Khilafah of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib in Salawatullahi Alayhi. Number two, we will examine the philosophy of Imam Ali when it comes to governance and power. Number three, we will examine the opposition of Imam Ali's perspective and philosophy on governance and power. Number four, we will examine the extremely important events which took place prior to the departure of Rasulullah from this dunya and until he took the Khilafah in the year 35. And finally, we will look at Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib's treatment towards the opposition and the rights and privileges which they enjoyed while he was the Khalifa of his time. وَصَلُّوا عَلَىٰ مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدٍ In the year 1997, Kofi Annan writes a letter referring to the letter of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib to his governor Malik al-Ashtar al nakhain to Egypt. He quotes and references the letter where Imam Ali writes to Malik, Waya Malik, أشعر قلبك الرأفة والرحمة للرعية ولا تكن عليهم سبعا ضاريا فإنهم صنفان إما أخ لك في الدين أو نظير لك في الخلق أو مالك Do not allow your heart to be like the heart of a beast of a lion waiting to attack the subjects. However, allow your heart to feel compassion, to feel mercy for those subjects, for either they are one, your brethren in faith, or two, your brethren in humanity. So Kofi Annan makes a reference to this letter and he says, all the world leaders today all the world leaders today shall emulate the example of Ali and their governance. Shall emulate the example of Ali ibn Abi Talib and their governance. In the year 2002, the committee, the United Nations Committee on Human Rights, and their extensive report Write the following statement. Listen to the statement. They wrote in their extensive report that the Caliph Ali ibn Abi Talib is the fairest governor which appeared in human history. Can you comprehend this? The Caliph Ali ibn Abi Talib is the fairest governor who has appeared in human history. Human history has not 
seen a governor more fair and compassionate than Ali ibn Abi Talib. That is why a Christian thinker, a Christian author by the name of Paul Salama. Paul Salama has a lot of poetry, a lot of writings, and every time he uses the example of nobility, he uses Ali. Every time he uses the example of bravery, he uses Ali. Every time he uses the example of knowledge, he uses Ali. Every time he, exam he gives the example of generosity, he uses Ali. So they went to him, they said to him, Allah, Shurammasi, he has the, your Shia has the. Are you Christian? Or are you Shia? Because you seem not to know anyone besides Ali, a Christian Lebanese thinker, author. So he writes a book, he writes a book called Ali, the Voice of Human Justice. Ali, the Voice of Human Justice, and in the introduction of that book, he writes those lines of poetry, responding to the claim whether he's Shi'i or Christian. What does he say? He says, لا تقل شيعة غلاة علي أن في كل منصف شيعية Do not say that the Shia exaggerates in their love for Ali for an every just man as Ali ibn Abi Talib. An every just human being lies Ali ibn Abi Talib. لا تقل شيعة غلاة علي. Do not say that the Shia exaggerated their love for Ali. And في كل منصف شيعية. For in every just man lies Ali. Then he says جل جل الحب في المسيحي حتى صار في فرط حبه علوية. يا سماء شهدي ويا أرض قرني إنني قد ذكرت علي. What does he say? He says, the love of Ali has boiled in the heart of the Christian, referring to himself. And that's whether his love for Ali, he has not only become a Shia, but he's become a Alawi. Then he says, O oh skies, witness, and O oh soil of this earth, confess that I have uttered the name of Ali. I have said the name of Ali. Number two. What was the philosophy of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib towards governance and power? <coughs> when he became the Khalifa, the most powerful man ruling the Islamic territory and the Islamic empire, one day he was fixing his sandal. He had a na'al. And he was fixing his na'al. Ambar came to him. Ibn Abbas narrates that Ambar came to him and he said to him, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, there is a delegation of respectful people, very important people, and they are here to congratulate you because of taking the Khilafah. Because now you are, that you are the Khalifa, they have gathered from all over the Islamic territory to give that respect to you, to congratulate you, as he was fixing his shoes, his sandal. So he took the sandal, he waved the sandal to Ibn Abbas. He said, Yatna Abbas, how much is this sandal worth? Ibn Abbas says, I was ashamed to tell him it's worthless. It has no significance, it has no value, because he had taken that na'al so many times to the repair, that nobody would pay anything for it. But I said to him, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, it's worth a dollar, a penny, a cent. So he says, Ya Ibn Abbas, this khilafa of yours, this position of yours, is worth less than this na'al to Ali ibn Abi Talib if he does not give justice to those who are facing injustice. This is his 
philosophy on power. This is his philosophy on governance. And another hadith, and another eloquent statement, he says, Wallah, لو أعطيت الأقاليم السبع لكي أعصي الله في نملة أسلمها شعيرة لما فعلت. He says, I swear by Allah, if they give me the seven heavens and whatever is within them and whatever surrounds them, they give me the entire universe. To take a little piece of bread away from an ant carrying that piece of bread, to take that piece of bread from the ant in injustice, I would not do so. What does he give his advice to his sons, Hassan and Hussein? He says, Bunayya Hassan, Bunayya Hussein, Kunu lil-dhalimi khasma wa lil-mazlumi awna. Oh Hassan, oh Hussein, stand in the face of oppression and injustice and be an assistant and an ally to the oppressed to the mazloom, to the poor people. Today we find that Muslims, Muslims in Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria are killing other Muslims. Yesterday in Iraq, one car bomb, 35 dead, 65 injured. Same thing in Kabul, same thing in, in Karachi, same thing in Lahore. Same thing in different parts of the Islamic world. Muslims killing one another. Huh? But Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, listen, you are the followers of Ali. But we do not follow Ali just by name. We follow Ali by respect we give to others. We follow Ali in the way he taught us. And the map he drew for us. We don't just say we're the followers of Ali, but we disrespect other people. We humiliate other people. We put other people down. This is not the method of Imam Ali. Imam Ali would not point at other people and call them mukhalif. Imam Ali never actually refer to other people by you are different than me. He never separated himself from the people. He embraced the people. He respected the people. Inshallah, we'll speak about that. So, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, Salawatullahi, Wasalamu alayhi, this leader that we follow, that we are meant to emulate, teaches us respect, respecting others. He says in his Khutbatul Jihad, Khutbatul Jihad, go read Nahjul Balagha, open Khutbatul Jihad, he says, وأما بعد فقد بلغني أن الرجل منهم يدخل على المرأة المسلمة وأخرى المعاهدة فيسلب منها حجلها وقلائدها فتستغيث به بالسرحام And I have now heard, Imam Ali says to his people, I have now heard that some of the troops of Muawiyah coming inside Iraq Go on to the Muslim woman. Muslim woman. A non-Muslim woman under the protection of Islam. And they take away their jewelry. They take away their earrings. They take away their jewels. Then he says, If a Muslim man hears this news, that the Muslim army was attacking the Muslim female and the non-Muslim female who needed protection and dies 
ومات من بعده أسفا لما كان عندي ملوما بل كان عندي جديرا به If you were to die from sadness and sorrow I would not blame that man This is Imam Ali's definition of power to help the poor to help those in need of power whether it's a Muslim woman or a non-Muslim woman under the protection of Islam. He never differentiated between the Muslims and the non-Muslims when he was the Khalifa. You've all heard the story of the Christian beggar. A man is begging. Imam Ali says, Ma'ala? What is this man begging? They say to him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, innahu rajul al-Masihi, Nasrani. Oh, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, he's a Christian man begging. Imam Ali says, I did not tell you what is he? What is his religion? I said, what is this? Why is there a beggar? A woman comes to him to receive the money from Bayt al-Mal. So he gives her, and she also comes with her slave. So he gives the slave. This woman goes home and comes back. She says to him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, excuse me, I think you made a mistake. He said, why? She said, because I'm an Arab. I'm a Muslim. My slave is a non-Arab and she's not a Muslim. But you gave her the same amount you gave me. So I think you made a mistake. Imam Ali takes a little bit of the sand from this hand. He takes a little bit of the sand from this hand and he raises his hands. And he said, what is the difference between this and this? The woman says, there is no difference between this and this. Then Imam Ali says, Anti min hadha wa hiya min hadha. You were created from this and she was created from this. Aqeel, his brother, comes to him. His older brother, who had gone blind. Imam Ali says, when he came, I can see the signs of hunger and starvation on him. I can see how poor he was. Sisters, do you... What language should I say? English, Farsi, what other language? Spanish. If there are children making noise, I cannot continue my lecture with all due respect. Please allow me to continue, inshallah, with to observe silence. May Allah bless you. May Allah, this is the respect we give to the majlis of Imam Hussein. I know that all of us want to bring our children. We want the barakah for our children. However, everything has its etiquettes. We cannot speak in the middle of salah. It has a specific etiquette. We have to face the qibla. It has a specific etiquette. Also, the majlis of Imam Hussein has a specific ihtaram and etiquette. May Allah bless you. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower onto us from his compassion and mercy, recite the second salawat with the loudest of your voices. Aqeel comes to him, he says to him, Ya Ali. Everyone, when they became the Khalifa, they were giving to their brothers, to their sisters, to their cousins, to their... I do not have money to live. Give me more from my Tuman. Imam Ali, he has a candle. He goes and turns off one candle, he turns on the other one. Aqeel says to him, why? He says to him, because this is a personal matter you have with me. I cannot use the candle from Baytul Man. I use my personal candle. Huh? Then he says to him, Ali, sit down. Aqil, sit down. I will give you. So Aqil sits down. Then he puts the sword, the fiqar, inside the fire when it heats, when it becomes red. He points towards the hand of Aqil. He says, Aqil, take. So Aqil brings his hand. As soon as it gets closer to the sword, he moves his hand. He says, Ah! Imam Ali says, ah, 
أنت إن من نار هيأها المخلوق للعبه وتبعثني إلى نار هيأها الخالق لغضبه. He says to him, you wine from the fire that the creation, meaning himself, has created to warm himself. Huh? But you send me to a fire that the Creator has made for his punishment. This is the equality. This is his philosophy on rule, on power, on governance. What was his opposition's philosophy on rule and governance? How did they perceive governance? This is the important question. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, when he became the Khalifa, when he declared himself as the Khalifa, he came to Kufa and he sat on the member of Masjid al Kufa and he says, Ya Ahl al Iraq, O oh, the people of Iraq, Wallah, ma qatantukum likay tu sallu wa tasumu wa tu zakku wa tahijju. He says, I did not fight with you, so you pray. I did not fight for, with you so you fast. I did not fight with you to pay the zakat or to perform the hajj. بَلْ قَاتَلْتُكُمْ لِكَيْ أَتَأَمَّرَ عَلَيْكُمْ But I fought with you to become your ruler. I fought with you to become your governor. And if you go astray, my sword will make you walk straight. This is the opposition's philosophy. Abdul Malik ibn Warman, he's given the title of Malik al-Muluk. Malik al-Muluk, the king of kings. The title of Allah, they give it to this one. Abdul Malik ibn Warman. Malik al the king of kings. Who is this king of kings? This king of kings, when he would walk from his house, read his biography, to the masjid, he would see some grasshoppers, malah. He would not step on the grasshoppers. He would say, I cannot step on the ants. I cannot step on the grasshoppers. When he became the Khalifa, he killed 50,000 people. Not only that, he took 30,000 people of his opposition and he popped their eyes out of their scalps while they were alive. Al-Hajjaj was born in the 40th year after the Hijrah. Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, the governor of Bani Umayyah to Iraq. The man who would say, I wish I was in Iraq, I was in Karbala to kill Hussein. Hajjaj <coughs> would not eat a meal unless there was blood from the followers of Ahlul Bayt in the meal. Sometimes you would say, I have no appetite. Go bring someone from the followers of Ali, kill him in front of me so I can have appetite to eat. Not only Hajjaj, Harun. Harun al Rashid, they call him Harun al Rashid, the wise. Harun al Umawi. Let us read our history, let us find out what happened. Huh? We appreciate sitting now in the majlis. We appreciate having access to the ulama. Do you know the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, what they had to endure? At the time of Harun, one day, he had Harun had a friend by the name of Ibn Qahtaba. One day, Harun was drunk, so he tells his slave, go call Ibn Qahtaba. So Ibn Qahtaba comes in the middle of the night. He says to him, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, what do you need? He says to him, Ya. 
What do you have to offer for us? What do you have to offer to the Khalifa? So Ibn Qahbaba says, O oh Harun, I am willing to offer myself to you. So he says to him, You yourself, what do you what, what are you worth? You're worth nothing. I have an army of hundreds of thousands of people. Go back. As soon as he goes back again, the ambassador of the Khalifa, Al Harun, comes to him and says, Ajib al Amir. So he comes, Assalamu alaikum Amir al Mu'mineen. And Harun is drunk. The Khalifa is drunk. He says to him, What do you need? He says to him, What do you have, Ibn Qahtaba, to offer Amir al Mu'mineen? He says, I have my wealth. I will give you all my wealth. He says to him, Ibn Qahtaba, I have a lot of wealth, more than you. I don't need your wealth. Go. The third time he comes and he says to him, Ajib al Amir, what do you have to offer? He says, I have my wealth, myself, my children for the Amir. He says, I don't need you, your wealth, or your children. Go. The fourth time he comes, what do you have to offer? Myself, my wealth, my children, and my harm. My mahram. He says to him, no, I don't need your mahram. There's plenty of them here. Go. The fifth time, he says, Ajib al-Amir, he says, I'm willing to give all of that. And one more thing. What is it? My faith. My religion. My deen. My iman. So then, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Harun al-Rashid, the wise, says to him, in Qahtaba, you have a deal. Sell your faith to the Amir. He sold his faith. When we hear such stories, let's think. Who have we sold our faith to? Who have we sold our faith to? Have we sold our well, our faith to a friend? Have we sold our faith to Shaytan? Have we sold our faith to our reputation in high school and college? Have we sold our faith to drinking or alcohol? What have we sold our faith to? Have we sold our, self, our faith to our own self? Some people sell their faith to their own selves. For their own pleasure. For their own desire. For their own greed. So as soon as he sells the faith, he's about to leave. Then this, the messenger says to him, where are you going? He says, I'm going to sleep. It's in the middle of the night. He says to him, no, you just sold your faith, we have work. He says, what is the work? He takes him by the hand to a prison. Listen, he opens the door of the prison. He sees 20 teenage boys sitting in the prison. He gives him a sword. He says, I want you to behead every one of them. He says, why? They're young boys, teenagers. Why would I behead them? He says, what's stopping you, your faith? It's already gone. So he says, I took, Ibn Qahbaba says, I took the sword and I beheaded every one of them. He said, my clothes were bloody, my hands was bloody, I was gonna go home. He says to me, where are you going? I said, I'm going home to sleep. He says to him, no, it's too early, why are you going? What's stopping you, your faith? You already sold your faith. He opened another door, he said, I saw middle-aged. 20 middle-aged people. I said, what should I do? He said, you take the sword, you behead every one of them. So he said, I did that. He said, again, I wanted to go home. He opened another door, 20 elders. Elders, white beards. Their face was full of light. I said to him, who are those people? Why are we beheading them? Listen to what he said. He said, they are the children of Ali and Fatima. Sadat. They are Sayyids. From Bani Hashim. Huh? And that's why we killed them. So he said, my hands were shaking. They were elderly. Ulama. How can I behead them? He said, but I did that matter to me because I had sold my religion. 
So he said, I beheaded 19, I approached the 20th one, I raised the sword. He said to me, Yabna Ahtaba, hold on before you kill me. I said to him, yes. He said, what would you tell our grandfather Rasulullah on the day of judgment if he tells you in one day you killed 60 Sayyids? What would you tell him? So he said, I raised the sword and I killed him. Why? Because the opposition's philosophy on rule and governance was that it has to stay. It has to stay by any mean necessary. Whether we kill 60 saints in one day, whether people sell their faith, it does not matter. As long as this faith stays. And let me tell you something. Some people hear the story and they say, Allah, this hajjah was such a bad man. Allahu Akbar, Ibn Qahtaba was so bad. Allahu Akbar, Harun al-Rashid was so bad. But sometimes me, when I'm given some power, I also abuse the power. I also become another Ibn Qahtaba. I also become another Harun. I also become another Hajjaj. One of my relatives, he says, one day, I went to Bazaar Tehran. There's a masjid, old masjid called Masjid al-Shah, now it's called Masjid al-Imam Khomeini. He said there, there's people who use the bathroom. So when they enter the bathroom, there's cans where people use to wash themselves. So he says there's a man, the janitor, he's sitting there. You give him some money, you take a, a bucket, and you go in the bathroom to wash yourself, huh? He says, a man came, he was in a rush, he was in a hurry, at the Dush. He came, he took one of those buckets, and he was running towards the bathroom. The janitor says to him, hey, so this man came and he put the other one, he took this one, and he went to the bathroom. This man said, I was there, I looked at this janitor, I said to him, what's the difference between this four pun and this four? Why did you make him come back? He said, oh, I scored one good shit. So why did God ask him? Look at someone that has five buckets for people to use themselves when they go to the restroom. He's given the small, tiny power how they have used the power. Sometimes we are tested by power. We're given some authority. We should test, we should ask ourselves, what are we doing with this authority? What are we doing with this power? Are we abusing it? Are we using it in the right way? Number three, what were the major events which took place in the time before the death of Rasulullah until the 35th year after the Hijrah. I will go through them very quickly. Very quickly. Number one, Sahih Bukhari states and the section of visiting the hill. Last section is called visiting the hill. Ibn Abbas states he says it was the Thursday before the Monday when Rasulullah passed away. Rasulullah passed away on a Monday. This is Thursday. So he says on a Thursday we were gathered next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And Rasulullah was ill. Sallu alayhi. Sallu alayhi. Listen to this. Rasulullah stated, "Atuni bi qalam wa qirtas likay aktub lakum ma intamassaktum bih lan tadhillu ba'di abada." 
allow me to write something for you on a piece of paper so that if you follow, you will not go astray. This is Sahih Bukhari. By Ibn Abbas, on the Thursday before the Monday of the demise of Rasulullah. Then he says the people there were divided into two groups. When Rasulullah says, give me a paper and pen, the people next to him were divided into two groups. Some of them said, yes, give Rasulullah a paper and pen to write. And then the other group said, do not give a paper and pen to Rasulullah. Who said that? Umar ibn al-Khattab. He said, do not give this man paper and pen. Why? Because he's sick. He may say something, you know, it doesn't mean. So don't give him a paper and pen. So they began, Ibn Abbas said, they began to argue amongst themselves. One says give, one says don't give, one says give, one says don't give. Until Rasulullah says, Tanahu anni. لا ينبغي الجدال عند رسول الله. He says, leave. Don't argue in front of the Prophet. Leave. So they left. Now, Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم, whatever he was writing, we're not going to say what he was going to write. But whatever he's going to write, he says, if you follow, then you will not go astray. Huh? But Rasulullah was not given the paper and pen by the Muslims. This is the first incident. We have to understand history. What is the second incident? The second incident was when the first Khalifa Abu Bakr was on his deathbed. Tariq al-Kabir, the Grand Tariq, Imam Bukhari, volume number two, page 105. He says when Abu Bakr was on his deathbed, Umar ibn al-Khattab came to him. He said to him, have you done your wasiyah? Have you written your wasiyah? He says, no. Then he had a slave, a servant, by the name of Shadid. He told him, Shadid, bring the Khalifa a paper and pen so he writes his wasiyah. So they brought a paper and pen. Shadid, the servant, brought a paper and pen. They gave it to Abu Bakr, فَوَصَّى بِهَا لِعُمَرِ بْنِ الْخَطَّابِ Then he wrote, that's the Khalifa after me, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he signed it. Then Shadid went and he told the people that the Khalifa Abu Bakr has made Umar his Khalifa. Huh? Then after the second Khalifa Umar, there was a delegation of people, delegation of people, to choose the Khalifa after them. And they almost gave bay'ah to Imam Ali. They say to him, we give you bay'ah under the guidance of the Quran, the Sunnah was Siratul Shaykhain. And the method of the Shaykhain. Imam Ali said, Kitab Allah wa Sunnah Rasulihi wa na'am. Wa amma Siratul Shaykhain fa ishtihadi ana. He says, Kitab Allah and the Sunnah of Rasulullah, I respect. However, the methodology and the method of the first and the second Khalifa, no, it is my own ishtihad, my own understanding. So they did not give him bay'ah. The third Khalifa, Uthman, came into power, and he was then assassinated. He was killed by the Muslims. And for seven days, his body remained unwashed and unburied. One of the things that you find in that period of time was the fact that Uthman ibn Affan had put many people of his family members as governors and people in charge. Amongst them was Walid, his stepbrother, the governor of Kufa, who as, as soon as he went to the house of Khilafa, he made the house of Khilafa, and he made a swimming pool there. And the swimming pool there was not for you to swim in there was full of wine for him to go there and to drink from the swimming pool. Then the Muaddin says, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, he gets up and he wears the amama and he goes and leads the prayers. So one day he prayed the morning prayers four instead of two. They say to him, Ya Amir, you prayed four instead of two. 
He says, yes, if you like, I can do eight. <laughs> After his assassination, the only democratic election in Islam was the Khilafah of Imam Ali. They all came to him. They say to him, you have to accept the Khilafah. You have to be the Khalifa. Imam Ali first refused. Then he describes, he says, they had a stampede at the door. And they ripped the shirt of Imam Hassan and Hussein, leaving me with no option but to take the Khilafah. And when he took the Khilafah, what happened? The first war was Jaman, 18,000. The second war was Sufin, 75,000. Then Nahrawan, four or 5,000 people. The agony in his heart. 35 years later, 40 years later, after the demise of Rasulullah, one day he's sitting, they bring him some halwa. They say to him, Ya Imam, please have some of this halwa. He says, no. They say, why? He says, nahnu fi huzn. We're mourning. We're in aza. They say, aza of whom? He says, the aza of Rasulullah and Fatima. Allahu Akbar. And he would always say, ilahi ab'ath ashqaha. لِكَيْ يُخَطْلِبَ دِمَاءَ هَذِهِ بِهَادِهِ Oh Allah, send the worst of them, the most evil of them, so that he would take the blood of this to dye the blood of this. Until Ibn Muljam came and struck him with the sword. And he then says, فُسْتُ وَرَبُّ الْكَعْبَةِ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ